by Yvette is zooming in. Let's begin. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call to order uh, this uh, meeting of uh, the Capitol of City Council uh, for this September 8th, 2022. Um, and just so everybody knows, you know, we have moved to uh, hybrid style meetings, which means that, um, well, some of the council members, or at least one of the council members, is here in person. The other council members uh, will be on Zoom, um, and as well, members of the public will be able to uh, participate in the meeting through Zoom. Uh, but I want to welcome all of you that are here tonight in person um, as we start to, I think, get back to uh, normalcy. Um, so with that, we'll start with, uh, Chloe, you want to make an announcement? Oh. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, in accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is open to the public with both in-person and remote attendance possible. Council and staff are attending in person and remotely via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting via Zoom using the Zoom application or a landline or mobile phone along with how to make public comment during the meeting tonight is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our website or our YouTube channel. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. And our technician this evening is Brian. Thank you, Mayor. Right. Thank you, Chloe, and thank you, Brian, for being our technician uh, this evening. Uh, and with that, let's have roll call. Council Member Bertrand. Present. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Brown. Present. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. And Mayor Story. Here. Thank Will you. everybody uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Staff has no changes to the agenda. Okay. Um, seeing no changes, let's move on now to presentations. The first is um, the um, introduction of the Recreational Division staff, Brenda Howard, Recreation Coordinator, Beach Lifeguard Services, Junior Guards, and Sports. Hi, Nikki. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I am here to introduce to you Brennan Howard, uh, the city's new recreation coordinator for Beach Lifeguard Services, Junior Guards, and Sports. Um, in this role, he will serve as the city's lifeguard captain as we work to further develop our lifeguard tower services for the next season. Brennan is a resident of Capitola who grew up surfing here and was known frequently for accompanying his grandpa, Charlie Howard, to the courtyard after school when Charlie worked for the city. Brennan has participated in junior guard program since the age of six and first worked for the city in 2018 as a junior guard instructor until he was promoted to coordinator for the last two seasons. This past spring, he participated in the city's partnership with Santa Cruz Marine Safety uh, taking part in their academy and leadership training. Brennan is an adept waterman with experience ranging from teaching surf lessons to operating boats and skis in extremely dangerous conditions. He is passionate about service as a first responder to others in their time of need, teaching life-saving and ocean safety. 
Brennan is excited to join the staff for the city that has shaped him into who he is today and dedicated to developing a lifeguard program that the city and residents will have pride in. So I'd like to introduce to you Brennan Howard. Yes, welcome Brennan. Come right up. Good evening uh, city council and or city council members and mayor. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much for this opportunity for allowing me to be here and really produce something that this city can be proud of. Well, absolutely. Well, um, on behalf of the city of Capitola, as the mayor of Capitola, I, I want to welcome you and just say congratulations um, on your uh, obtaining this position. Uh, it sounds like with your background uh, in Capitola um, and your participation um, in the, the lifeguards training um, and the junior guards, I think you understand already the importance of the role that you're going to play um, and, uh, and how important water safety is to our community, you know, for the residents and all the people who visit us uh, throughout the year. So, um, well, congratulations. We we'll look forward to seeing you in the Park and Recs Department. Um, and um, um, yes, and um, I think you're going to have a great future here. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Brennan. All right. And next we have uh, the Junior Guards Participant Recognition. Um, you're going to lead us in that presentation, Brennan? Yes. Uh, yes. I, Nikki has some things to oh, say Oh, Nikki, first. you can? Yes, okay. Mayor. I'm, I'm going to kick us off, um, but I think I need to manage the screen first. So let me start this. I'm going to do the slides in a second. All right. Um, so uh, before, I, before I pull the slides up, I wanted to just provide a little bit of intro to the council um, that we are here to recognize um, our, the Junior Guard participants' accomplishments that um, happened over the summer. So this summer was particularly notable as it was the first that we were in full operation. Um, since 2019 due to the pandemic. And so as a result of that, um, this was the first opportunity for our junior guard participants to engage, to be recognized for their achievements, for the community that they build on the beach and, um, and the, the, what they put back into the community as well. Um, Brennan is gonna walk us through exactly what a lot of these awards mean within the program. Um, but it is very common for the individuals that we're recognizing tonight to be the staff that put back into the future. So it is very likely that if we pay close attention to these young people, we are going to see them join uh, city staff sometime in the future. And so um, with that, I also wanna just add a little footnote in that we're gonna share a bunch of photos that were taken um, on the beach and these photos were actually taken by RPM training, which um, provided through the Capitola Public Safety Foundation, a very generous grant that went to scholarships um, for the program as well. So um, enjoy the photos. They are the highest quality we've had so far. So we're really excited about them. Um, all right, so I'm gonna share a screen here. Do I need to maximize? Changing there. Okay. All right, and so for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brennan, um, who's going to tell us a little bit more about what all these different awards mean. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Is that good? Um, yes. So this year we had a pleasure of giving out several notable awards um, to some exceptional people. These awards each hold their own meaning and the bearers of these awards truly embody them. And that's through the Junior Guard program. Um, we would like to recognize them each in their own light and their names will be shown on the screen just for time purposes. Um, to begin with, we have division wide awards. Um, they're given out to every single age group um, they include a team captain, most improved, best sport, and best all around. Uh, recipients of this award 
once again, we'll have their names shown on the slide. Uh, so to begin with, we have the team captain. Uh, team captain demonstrates leadership on a daily basis. They're described as having the ability to lead the group, not only socially, but by example. They're physical leaders as well as social leaders. Um, they have extreme enthusiasm, and they're described as if all the instructors were to go missing, the coordinator wasn't showing up, they would be the ones running, they would be the ones running the beach. That regardless, those kids would make sure that this program was running smoothly and with the same charismatic behavior and command that the instructors have as well. Uh, next, we have the most improved. Um, this goes to a junior guard who probably was struggling towards the beginning of the session and maybe didn't feel comfortable socially or physically in what we were doing just because we have long swims it's large groups of kids so they might have been struggling and then in that they had their hardships and they persevered through them they kept pushing themselves on a daily basis till they got better and that earns them the right to most improved next we have best sport best sport is someone that has a very, very positive attitude. They're outgoing, and even in the bleakest of moments, on the hottest of hot days, on the cold, rainy days in the morning, they're sitting there smiling. After long workouts, they sit there and they, they're excited for whatever's com to come next. And overall, are just there to enjoy what's in front of them. After that, we have a uh, best all around. This goes to an individual who tries their hardest in everything. They're an adept in whatever you throw them, throw at them. They'll put the 100% forward, and they'll also bring up the people around them. Um, this uh, shows prowess in junior guards, not only because it's a s just natural skill, but it shows that they're there to help each other, and they're there to really support the people around them. Um, from there, we have session-wide awards. So these are given out once a session. They're Iron Man, Iron Woman, and the Dory Award. Um, these are across all divisions. So regardless of age group, you can get these awards if you earn them. But that also means that if you have to be nominated by not only one instructor, but the entire staff has to agree that this person truly deserves this award over everyone else. Um, so, to start, we have Iron Man and Iron Woman. It's very similar to Best All Around. However, it's across the whole beach. They show a physical dominance in the entire beach of working out and just being extremely fit. They push their limits and the limits of the, their friends and their people around them. Um, they're often described as eating nails for breakfast, glass for lunch, and rocks for dinner. They pawn the phrase IDGT, which is I don't get tired, regardless of what's in front of them. They're there to push themselves and see what their limits are and expand on them. Um, the next award we have is the Dory Award. And the Dory Award goes to an individual who truly embodies who Dory was. I won't get into the history of who Dory was, but even their own trials and hardship, they put their best foot forward. Um, Regardless of their own situation, they're putting their all towards this program, sorry, to make sure that it, it continues and moves forward. And they put their whole body and soul in this program regardless of what is around them and what's happening. And they're devoted to the people around them. Um, so lastly, this is our last award that we give out and it's given out once a year it's the Junior Lifeguard of the Year. Um, this is someone that not only attended both sessions, but was supportive, reliable, charismatic, and the most well-rounded Junior Guard of the Year. They're always eager to help and consistently put in 100% on the table. And at that, they weren't just naturally gifted in this. For this individual specifically, he always was there, always trying to help, seeing where he can improve, and showed 
just a very like altruistic behavior. He was eager to help those around him and improve on himself as well. He wanted to find those things that were wrong so that when he came back to us next year, he was ready to instruct. And for me, that truly defines what a Capitol Junior Guard is, is someone that knows their imperfections, but is willing to work hard and limit them. And so um, with that, we'd like to just pause for a minute and invite um, any of our audience that is a Dory Award Junior Lifeguard of the Year or Iron Man, Iron Woman to come up. Oh, we don't have a mic. Uh, oh, it is there. Yes, it is. Come on up. All right, so... Um, I would like to, we'll have, a, we have a camera here. So we're looking at that camera. Come on up, come on up. So we have here Eva. I think it's actually that camera right there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So a certificate, I think that she wants to check that out for me. Make sure it's not that. And a, cert a mayor certificate for you, you in recognition for this achievement. Um, it is as we as we started off saying this is a a recognizable achievement within this community and we really applaud the work that you do and are happy to have you here to and be able to recognize that so if we'll pause for a quick photo um, Well, I just want to add my congratulations to um, well, all the junior lifeguard participants this year, uh, and particularly to all the award winners um, and the Dory winners. Congratulations. Congratulations, Eva. Good job, and we hope to see you back next year. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. All right. You're welcome. bit more yeah um, and so to just kind of wrap up uh, the presentation we do have um, there were seven individuals in total um, and we will be mailing out the rest of the certificates so um, and to complete this we did want to take a minute and just recognize um, our the regionals efforts that we did this summer as well. So again, because of the pandemic, the regionals competition was interrupted. And um, this year we were able to send 47 participants to Huntington Beach. Um, and Brennan, if there's anything that you wanted to say about that. Uh, yeah, so we got to compete in Huntington, which was amazing. And we have a reputation there for not only showing prowess in our work ethic and our ability to get the podium, but also socially. Um, I heard from several people running events from USLA members to C CSLSA members commenting on our ability to be the first people to show up as well as the last to leave. Is that as soon as we got somewhere, we were asking, hi, I'm here, what can I do to the help? Which I think is... Uh, a good aspect that we have in its own. On top of that, we also showed how well we can do, and even in this town, we're known nationally and internationally for what we can put on the table in these events. And with that, that concludes our presentation.
we're happy to answer any questions at this time. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for these presentations. Um, I, I have such, um, I think, respect and admiration for all the junior lifeguard participants and all the instructors, um, and that I'm very proud that the city of Capitola has a program like this. Uh, and um, it's very important to our community. And um, I particularly want to acknowledge, uh, you know, of course, the Junior Lifeguard of the Year, um, Sam. Um, and um, um, I think that's a wonderful accompli accomplishment. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge, and um, I have particular respect for the most improved Junior Lifeguard, because those are the ones who, even though when they started, they may have been struggling, but they showed perseverance, they showed determination and courage to keep going uh, and to get better. And I think that's a lesson that we can all embrace um, and um, on any endeavor that we may have. So uh, congratulations to everyone. Congratulations on the wonderful program. And being back in full, um, I, I would say just participation once again, you know, after the um, pandemic hiatus. And so with that, I, I guess I'll leave it and see if you, any of the council members uh, have comments that they would like to make. Oh, yes, uh, council member Brooks. Hi everyone. I'm so, I apologize for not being able to be there to celebrate with with all of you and this, these much deserved awards. I just want to know what the secret is to get my eight year old interested in participating in junior guard. She just won't do it. So maybe next year she'll be out there and you might be there too. And um, hopefully we'll cross paths, but congratulations to all of you. And um, I'm, I, I look forward to seeing what, what's to come and, and next year and all and the greatness you bring to, to the, the beaches and so forth. So congratulations. Okay, any other comments by council members? Um, yes, uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thanks, hey, Mayor. Yeah, I just want to reiterate um, what a, a feat even just doing junior gardens is. I am in awe every time I see um, any of the sessions going on. And thank you, Brennan. Uh, welcome to the, the team for the city. We're happy to have you and keep the program going strong. Congratulations to everybody that got through a, another season in full swing. So let's keep that going. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Nikki, uh, for this presentation. Um, and, you know, once again, and, and thank you for all the um, junior guards and their families who came out uh, to the council meeting tonight to participate uh, in this recognition and award ceremony. So um, thank you, appreciate it. All right. Thank you, yeah. city council members and mayor. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Oh, yes, um, I think Mr. I, mayor? Oh, yeah. yeah, is that uh, council member um, Bertrand? Hello? Yes, I, I don't know if I could be um, heard. But yeah, uh, we can hear you. Go, go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, I'm down here uh, south of uh, Santa Cruz and Capitola, representing our city at our Cal League uh, convention, uh, which is an annual convention. And one of the proudest things I had to do um, when we had our local meeting of the uh, people in our area was to brag about our junior guards and how well they do. And it was so nice to hear um, the presentation today, uh, just exemplifying, you know, our spirit and the fact that there's so many people that have, you know, stepped up and done so well. Um, it, it was great to brag about <laughs> the junior guards, a program I feel particularly strong about. And um, do we that? You got to persevere with your kid. My, my daughter went through a few ups and downs as far as joining junior guards. And then for all the kids that are out there, as soon as she got into it, she had to do both sessions. <laughs> this is a time when you could do two sessions. Well, there was four sessions, but you could do you know, two in a row. 
So um, she really jumped in and, and did well in flags. And so to any kid that's listening, you know, your brother or sister that just did so well, just remember you can do just as well. And it's a great way to meet all your friends that you'll see in school and all the kids that live in your neighborhood. And um, I asked my daughter once, you know that kid across the street, he's walking up the street and said, oh, yeah, I know him, he's the junior guards. So the reality of junior guards is great for the kids, and it just makes them feel so much at home here in Capitola. And to know that we're um, recognized across the state as a great team. So the last thing I have to say is go Tola. All right. Thank you for that, Council Member Bertrand, and for the, those uh, suggestions. Um, so with that, uh, let's move on to uh, the next item uh, this evening, which is um, any additional materials for tonight's agenda. Uh, no, none were received, Mayor. Okay, seeing none, we'll now move on to um, oral communications. Uh, this is opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda or items that are on the consent agenda. Um, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak during this time? Seeing none, um, do we have, um, yeah, it looks like we have somebody in Zoom. Yes, if anybody in the uh, Zoom would like to speak, just uh, raise your hand in the Zoom or you can dial star nine. Uh, and speak over the phone. I have someone, so Nori, you should be able to unmute yourself. You go ahead. Hi, um, this is Lori Hill, and I wanted to um, thank the council for your support of the tribute to the Capitol Bone Festival that occurred this weekend. Uh, thank you to Mayor Story and acting as Commissioner Story. He helped secure some funding for the music that we had uh, in Esplanade Park. Thank you to Yvette Brooks for stopping by and, and checking in on the exhibit. And um, just thank you for, for all the support regarding that event. Uh, the museum was able to bring in over $1,000 in donations on, on that weekend alone. Uh, and so my full report will be before the Arts, be before the Arts and Cultural Commission um, this coming Tuesday, but I just wanted to express my thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Lori, while you're still there, uh, just uh, our thanks to you, because I know you did a tremendous amount of work to put that event together. Um, and um, our congratulations to uh, all the uh, Historical Museum board members uh, who helped uh, put that uh, exhibit together. Um, so it, it was um, a, a wonderful uh, remembrance. Um, so thank you. Um, is there anyone else that would like to speak in oral communications? I don't see anyone. Yes. Okay. Seeing none, um, I'm going to now move on to uh, staff and city council comments, and we'll start with staff comments. Council, Mr. Mayor, I have a pretty short update tonight. I just wanted to let everybody know that there is a flex alert on, and there has been some rolling blackouts, I understand, last evening. I do not anticipate uh, that we would lose power here, but if we did, um, we would terminate the meeting and reschedule the items that were remaining on the agenda for a future date. So if we suddenly lost connection, and those of you who are participating by Zoom, uh, that would be the plan. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you for that heads up, Jamie. Um, any other staff comments? So I'll move on now to uh, city council comments. Do um, council members have updates, reports? See that? Okay, seeing none. Um, and, um, Mary's story. <laughs> my, oh, uh, it, it might be tricky to see my hand, I, the background. Yeah, thank you for alerting me. Uh, I, I did not see it, so. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if I may, I just. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to our public works, our public works department. Um, I received a um, request to look at a fire hydrant that happened to be in the middle of one of our sidewalks, and it was in front of um, a, 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 
home of where somebody who who lives in a or who is in a wheelchair that I couldn't was just having trouble passing by and with the great thinking and collaboration with our, our other local partners and um, the public works department jumped on it and quickly resolved the problem and and um, I just wanted to say thank you so much they are so appreciative I'm appreciative of making our, our sidewalks more accessible for everyone so thanks so much Thank you. Are there other council members? Um, I'm just double checking now, make sure I'm not missing any hands. Um, council member Bertrand, are... Okay, I don't, we may have lost him, but um, let's um, move on then to the consent items for this evening. Uh, are there any uh, items that um, the council members would like to remove for further discussion? Consent items will be voted on in one vote. Seeing none, um, I did. I, I, on Mayor Story, Council Member Bertrand's hand is raised. Okay. Do you? Yeah, Council Member Bertrand. We actually can't see him on there. the video. Um, oh. I just like, well, I, um, my uh, connection is really bad. That's why um, my video is off. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. I just want to take note of an item on the consent item. Um, agenda rather, and that is the uh, contribution of 20000 from the school district uh, to the um, program that Nikki Haley, uh, Nikki has um, been working on in conjunction with the school district. And so I want to thank the uh, trustees of the SoCal Unified School District for that contribution, uh, just a special mention. And um, it's a testament to the program as a whole, which is a cooperative effort between the school district and Capitol. And that's why. You get some money to help keep it going. Thank you. Okay. Um, so it looks like no items are being requested to be pulled from the consent agenda. Um, I don't want to pull item A with the minutes, but I did have a um, maybe a, a clarification, if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. And on uh, uh, in, in oral communications on that item from that meeting, the very last paragraph. Um, it says that Mayor Story explained that council previously determined not to place a vacant home tax measure on the November 2022 20, ballot and the issue and that the issue was not being researched at this time. Um, now, I don't recall the exact word I may have used, but um, and the video would confirm that. But I did want to clarify and if what I uh, meant to say was that the matter was not being pursued at this time. Um, I certainly didn't want to intimate that the, the city was somehow restricted uh, from, um, you know, considering or looking at the measure um, uh, in some, in any fashion at all. So it's not being pursued, um, but, you know, the city may be continuing to look at it. So um, with that clarification on the minutes, um, I'll ask for a motion to approve. I'll move. I can second that. Is there a second? Yes. So, so there's a motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Kaiser to approve this consent calendar uh, agenda. Can we have a roll call vote? Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Thank you. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. The consent calendar passes unanimously, which will bring us to item 8A, which is a Mayor res Story? Uh, oh. Yes. Hi. Mayor Story, hi. I just wanted to pipe in here and offer a report out from closed session. Oh, That's 
Okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, I didn't see it on the agenda, but yeah, that's fine. I, can, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> I was just making sure I didn't skip it. <laughs> so, yes, you please. Skip it at all. We, please I for. Skip it as well. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Thank you, our city attorney. Okay. Please report on uh, closed session. Great. Thank you. So, the council had a closed session at a special meeting this afternoon at 3 30 on the item that was on the agenda, and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, which will now bring us to item 8A, which is a resolution supporting local measure K on the November uh, 8th, 2022 ballot. The recommended action is to adopt a resolution supporting um, local measure K, which is the Santa Cruz High School District bond on the November 8th, 2022 ballot. I wanted to see if uh, Chris Monroe is here. Oh, yes, she is here. Um, so can we go ahead with a staff report? We can. I don't have too much of a staff report. This item was uh, placed on the ballot on the agenda at the request of Mayor Story last meeting. Chris Monroe, the superintendent of Santa Cruz City High School District, will be making the presentation. And the only thing I would ask is just make sure you talk into the mic so our folks on Zoom can hear you real well. And I will be sharing my screen if you just want to give me a moment to get it queued up. And the, your camera is there. Good evening. Thank you so much for having us here this evening. We appreciate evening. Um, the council members considering supporting this measure, and we also want to express our gratitude to you all for your service to our community. Um, my name is Chris Monroe, and it's been my um, honor to serve as superintendent for Santa Cruz City Schools for the last eight years. And um, here th with me this, this evening is um, Sam Rollins, our Chief of Communications and Community Engagement. And he's gonna actually walk us through the presentation and I'll be here to um, help answer questions as we, if there are any. All right, thank you. Should I just sort of gesture to you and I wanna advance the slide? Yeah, I will try to intuit it, but. All right, sounds good. So um, thank you to everyone on Zoom and in person for giving us this opportunity to sort of walk you through why we have put this bond on the ballot. Um, I am the Chief of Communication and Community Engagement for Santa Cruz City Schools, which is, as you can see, a bit of a misnomer because we serve a community that goes far beyond the city of Santa Cruz. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we have uh, students from Capitola at Soquel Harbor and Santa Cruz Highs um, because we are the district that serves the city of Capitola. And since we're a district of choice, we have um, students going to all of those high schools. Um, and what we want our community to know um, as we're seeking this bond is that our school district, like every school district, is not funded specifically to build, repair, or modernize any of its facilities. This is a representation of our um, income and our expenditures. And um, our state, like most in the union, um, consider things like sustainability, modernizing classrooms, even plumbing, roofing, wiring, and school safety to be local decisions. We're not funded to do this. The only way that we can is to go out for facilities bonds and essentially ask our community if these are priorities for your high schools. Um, and so we were incredibly grateful in 2016 to have so much community support and to pass the bonds that we put on the ballot at that time. They were the first bonds that we put on the ballot in almost 20 years, which is a bit unusual for um, school districts, and I'll get to more on that in just a second. Um, and for the last five years, we have done really, it's been wonderful to see the change in our high schools across the district. Um, we've modernized stadiums and classrooms and performance spaces and um, done a lot of necessary infrastructure work that um, we, were, we had a lot of needed repairs after 20 years of no um, bond revenue. And this is really significant because a growing body of research is drawing an ever more direct line between the outcomes that students see and the quality of learning spaces um, that they attend school in. That both teachers and students just do far better when they are in facilities that are well kept, that are attractive, that are modern and um, safe. Um, so, yeah, we always like every time we give one of these presentations to celebrate the wonderful things that have come to our high schools over the last five years. 
But um, as I said before, if you advance to the next slide, we knew when we passed our bonds in 2016 that going 20 years, which is about twice as long as school districts tend to go without bond funding, meant that we were looking at a lot more needed repairs than we were getting money to address. Um, and so after bond A, which is our high school bond from 2016, is depleted, we will still have roughly half of the necessary repairs and modernizations still to complete. Um, which we knew going into it because, again, we have schools that are over 100 years old and going 20 years without any repair adds up. And so um, we are seeking a bond this November to complete that work. Um, and when I speak of the repairs, the necessary repairs and modernizations at these sites, this was a list of work that we put together in collaboration with our community. We held a lot of outreach meetings to decide what the priorities were. And so we do see that list as something of a contract that we made with our community. Um, in November of 2022, we do have some unique opportunities associated with this bond that we won't just be working on modernization and repair, but we have the opportunity to dramatically increase sustainability at our high schools, um, as well as embark on a workforce housing project, which would be a new endeavor for us, but we think could be a huge boon to the community. So, First of all, sustainability, we have been doing a lot of this work over the past few years. It's been um, a goal of ours. About a third of our power comes from solar currently, but with the passing of this bond, we would be able to dramatically expand that and accelerate all of our sustainability efforts. Um, this is both in the creation of energy, but also in the efficiency of the schools themselves with heating and insulation and lighting and everything that we would be able to do. Um, and this not only is good ecological sense, but will mean cost savings for our community for decades in the future. Um, we also have the opportunity with a small investment from the bond to do something a little bit unique. Um, classroom teachers are, of course, the most important factor in student outcomes. Um, but we in this greater community have uh, unique challenges in recruiting and retaining great talent. We have great talent. It's hard to hang on to the wonderful teachers that we have with the cost of living um, being so challenging. So um, our district is lucky in that we own land that can be developed upon on the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, and with just 5% of this bond funding as an initial investment, we would be able to create a workforce housing project that would have 80 units, um, dedicated housing for teachers and support staff that with the initial bond investment putting us ahead of our payoff schedule of construction loans, we would be able to offer these teachers and support staff members um, subsidized rent so that they would be able to um, live better and more easily in our community. Um, it's really important for us because we've lost almost 100 teachers since 2014 to the cost of living in this part of the world. Um, and nearly all of the job offers that we have declined come um, after teachers and staff members attempt to find housing in the area and realize that it is not going to be a sustainable option for them. Um, and then while we have students from Capitola at all of our high schools, we know that SoCal High is the closest. And so we wanted to just sort of show the city council and everyone watching um, the prioritized list of projects that would be um, begun immediately where the, should the bond pass at SoCal High. And again, this list was put together in collaboration with our community. We had many rounds of input making sure that, um, that we were sort of making a good compromise between what our architects and staff members were telling us needed to happen and what our community wants and wanted to prioritize. And the last bit that we wanted to touch on is, of course, the fact that we are unable really to invest in our students' safety in any substantive way without bond funding. And with funding from the last bond, we were able to install security cameras at our high schools for um, after hours and to monitor entries. We, were, we have begun rolling out the smart lock system that was um, only possible because of the last bond. We fortified security fencing at all of our schools. And so the safety aspect, of course, is a facilities investment, and that's a part of bonds going forward. Um, and we wanted to be upfront about the costs associated with this. Of course, any resident in the city of Capitola would only be paying for one of the two bonds that we're putting on the ballot because they're only benefiting from one of the two bonds that we're putting on the ballot. Um, and the co average cost of a homeowner, um, and of course homeowners are the only ones who would be um, paying for it, is $180 per year. Um, and our superintendent very 
um, quickly pointed out, that's about six pizzas. So um, we see that as a very good deal uh, compared to all the things we'd be able to accomplish with it. And um, yeah, it's important to note that while the bond has a lifespan of 33 years, that's very front loaded and the cost tapers as that time goes on. And thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you, Chris. And uh, are there questions from council members on the presentation? Uh, yes. Uh, council Member Brown. Thank you. First off, I love it when any kind of numbers or math are presented to me in terms of comparable to pizza. That's the language that, that I speak uh, fluently, so I, I love that. Um, my question is, you had mentioned uh, dedicated workforce housing, so I just want to clarify that that is specific to the teachers and the staff um, would only have access to that housing, or is it still open to members of the public? So, do you want me to answer it? Or? Yeah, yeah, so that, uh, that, that's housing dedicated to teachers and um, workforce, and we would seek to offer it in proportion to our um, certificated and classified employees. But yeah, that would, we would own the, the property and essentially would be able to offer below market rents to um, employees. That's fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. I think. There are questions from other council members. Um, council member Bertrand, can you still hear us? Okay, hearing none. Yeah, uh, I can hear you, uh, but I didn't have a question. Oh, okay. I did have a question. What did you first back on amendments? You kind of garbled there, Council Member Bertrand. Could you repeat that? Yeah, what was the, the tapering uh, feature of the bond that, that was mentioned? Did you hear that question, Sam? Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, so I am not our finance director, so I can't speak to the specific decline. Um, but yeah, at the at the start of the bond's lifespan, the cost, the average cost to a homeowner in Capitola would be one hundred and eighty dollars per year. Um, and I have been, uh, yeah, I, I don't have specifics there. But in the thirty three years of the bond's lifespan, costs tapered down um, pretty significantly. Yeah. Do we have any more specifics? Just the district has opportunity to refinance the bonds at different points, and every time we have an opportunity to do that, that reduces the the, the cost. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Brown, you had a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's anything that would prevent the council from asking for the council members to address the council. Seeing no further questions from council members, I'll ask other members of the public that would like to address the council uh, on this item. Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back um, and um, uh, seeing if a council member would like to make a motion to uh, adopt a resolution supporting uh, Measure K. Um, but before you do that, I guess I, I want to um, uh, maybe you know explain why I asked for this to be put on the agenda. Um, uh, SoCal High School is very near and dear to my heart. I've had um, three daughters that went through SoCal High School. They don't currently attend there now. Um, and um, so, you know, through that period, I have have really come to know and learn about the importance of facility, um, the importance of retaining and keeping um, high quality teachers, um, and, um, and also the um, moving toward more sustainability in our facilities uh, and particularly safety in the high schools. Um, you know, so for all those reasons, that's why I asked to be, um, you know, this to be put on the agenda. Um, and in my capacity as the mayor of City of Capitola, in my personal capacity, uh, I have endorsed uh, both of these bond measures on behalf of the Santa Cruz City Schools. Um, so I, I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, speak to that, and then now I'll go to uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start. I have some comments, but I'll start by uh, making a motion to adopt the resolution supporting local measure K. Oh, second. Thank you. And then I, I just want to say briefly, this is a really exciting 
uh, measure. It reminds me a lot of the library uh, measure that we did. I want to say it was in 2016 um, in terms of, you know, modernization, replacement of things like aging roofs, plumbing, heating. These are a lot of the things I remember us talking about when we wanted to repair and upgrade our libraries and we were trying to get the library bond passed. And we have seen um, what a positive impact that's had on our community. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how this will have a positive impact on SoCal High and the other high schools uh, within the Santa Cruz High School District um, that many of our Capitol students go to. So I'm really excited about this. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, we have a motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by uh, Council Member Brooks. Um, are there any council members that uh, would like to speak to the motion? Seeing none, um, Chloe, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brown. I went out of order. Aye. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Chris and Sam, for being here this evening and for uh, giving us this presentation. Uh, and the best of luck to you uh, this coming November. Thank so you so much for you're your welcome. support. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Next, we'll move on to item eight. B, which is the Village Palm Tree Lights proposal. Um, and the recommended action is to consider a request from the Capitol Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area to replace the existing bright white rope lights on the palm trees throughout the village with warm white rope lights. Can we have a, Steve, you gonna? Yes, I have a short got, presentation here. Let me okay. see if I can. You going to shed light on this <laughs> item? That was a good one, Mayor Story. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, it works. Hold on. Put the camera. Put on my camera. Something new. All right. So it's been a whole two years since we've talked about Christmas. Lights in the village on the palm trees. Doesn't seem like it's been that long ago, but <laughs> it has been. <laughs> um, when we last talked about it, we were uh, kind of in the middle of a pandemic and, and decided to table it, so we're back today. There we go. <clears throat> so back in 2019, 2020, the city council in the Capitol Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area discuss bright light, the bright light rope lights that were installed in the palm trees in the village. Um, at the council's request, the BIA formed an ad hoc committee which made some recommendations. Those recommendations included switching out the rope lights for a low voltage LED lights in place of the rope lights. And unfortunately, that's about when the pandemic hit and that proposal was tabled at that time. It's quite an expensive proposal. I think it was upwards of $15,000 at that point. Um, the BAS, BIA has now submitted a proposal to switch out the bright light rope lights with the warm lights. I think everybody was in agreement back in, the 19, in 2019, 2020, that the warm lights would be more appropriate for the village than the bright white. So that's the, the um, impetus for their proposal now. We have breaking information on this that as of about two hours ago, the BIA has recently learned of another type of light called a coaxial LED. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it is evidently a light that um, will look like the old twinkle lights we had. Is it not working? The echo's gone? Okay. Yeah, we couldn't hear you on that. Got it, thank you. Um, the uh, proposal to, or uh, a new light that has been found with a coaxial LED that would emulate the LED, the low voltage LED lights uh, without, uh, at a substantially reduced cost. So I'm gonna show you that, um, various lights that we have and some slides, and then we will move forward and um, 
Karn Hanna from the BIA is here tonight and can talk about the coaxial LED and what we think that might be a viable option. So just to give you a clue, the, the lights here on the left in this picture are the bright white lights that we see today. This is back when we did a trial with the warm low lights, warm white lights in 2020, just so you can see the difference about what we're talking about in their original proposal. <clears throat> this one was when we did a trial with the LED, low voltage LED lights. You can see it's the, the smaller lights, uh, much more reminiscent of probably the, the twinkle lights everybody uh, was used to in the village prior to the rope lights going in, small, uh, warm white lights. This is all we really have for a picture of the LED coaxial light option. Um, it does appear to be an individual light. Uh, this picture is not the best, but it, it does appear to it. It does come in a warm light color, um, from what Karn shared with me earlier today. Um, these lights are much more affordable, and something. Um, well, I'll let Karn speak, but hopefully the BIA would be able to propose that we move forward with at this point. So the recommended action tonight is to consider the proposal to replace the existing rope lights with warm light, warm white rope lights or possibly LED coaxial lights. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Steve. Um, are there questions from council members? Yes, council member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. My question is um, just simply about the recommendation about how we would move forward with the or. Steve, do you have a plan of like showing us the two or what would, is, is that what you were saying? I'm sorry, yeah, I, I think what you. the, um, I need Karn to represent the BIA here, but I think that the plan would be that they would purchase or have a, a trial of the LED cloaks, coaxial lights installed and make sure that they're what we think they appear to be. And then they could proceed with that installation without needing to come back to council if they match the LED oh, okay. and the lights we've had in the past. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Great. Karin. Good evening. This is kind of weird. <laughs> kind of nice to be back, but kind of weird. Uh, Karin Hanna, representing the BIA. Um, yes. Sorry for the little wrinkle of you know, being here and asking for something that we can't actually give you 100% of the details, but we, we just sort of got wind of this and then there was the long weekend, yada, yada. Um, so, you know, we would like to make the community happy. We would like to put up the warm lights. Um, the twinkle lights proposed and shown in the sample there are really problematic from a maintenance standpoint. And they are, they are more expensive, they are not as durable, and they're very susceptible to vandalism. They can be cut with scissors or any kind of basic little knife. They can be pulled off of the trees really easily. So um, we were pretty discouraged. The rope lights have lasted basically with very minimal maintenance because there was the pandemic and there were all these other questions for three years, um, which is a pretty long time. The, the twinkle lights that were shown in that sample are probably more like a two-year duration um, with a fair amount of maintenance during that time, mainly depending on the vandalism issue. So when we heard about these new coaxial LEDs, which we don't really know exactly what they are, but the Christmas Tree Light Pro Company, who has done quite a bit of work in the village and for the BIA, um, brought that up kind of at the last minute possibility because they are uh, more durable and they are more affordable. So we would like, we're trying to get them to, you know, quickly put up um, a sample tree so that we can, we can all see it and, and determine it. Because our, we, there's a couple of things in addition to the cost of the lights. We really would like to have these up before Thanksgiving because we are the Village of Lights and Depot Hill is lit and you know it would just be kind of unfortunate if we would have like no lights at that point so um, and the crew is very busy I talk to them frequently and they're very busy and to take on this project would be very difficult so if we're able to put up the more affordable LED coaxial or 
if we don't feel those are satisfactory looking visually to put up the warm white rope lights, um, then the BIA would have in their budget currently money to procure the lights and pay for the installation of the lights by Christmas Tree Light Pros, CLP. Um, and so we feel like that would really be uh, advantageous for the city because they wouldn't have to try and you know everybody be all stressed trying to see if the crew could put the lights up and that's what these guys do and then they would have a certain amount of warranty from them and you know so there's a lot of advantages um, to doing that um, so uh, however we would like to ask if the city crew could take the current lights down because there's not the time frame on that there's from now until let's say a week or two before Thanksgiving to take down lights off of about 20 tre 27 trees i think so that seemed like a minor uh um ask and the savings would help us pay for it in our current budget and i think i think that's it well we we, we would like to sign a contract with um the christmas tree light pros as soon as possible they so that um we can get them up before Thanksgiving. So if we have to, so that's why we'd like a conceptual approval tonight um, so that we don't have to come back before the council in two weeks and have this whole conversation all over again about I like this and I like that. And we think that the community is gonna be a lot happier. We think the lights are gonna be uniform. We've got a couple of strategies to make them even more durable with the connectors to the power. So, um, you know, I, I do think that um, hopefully we, that the coaxial LEDs will be satisfactory, and if not, I think even the warm white rope lights will be a major improvement over what we have now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, are there questions from council members on the proposal? Um, any comments? And, well, I'll just maybe see if... Um, there aren't very many other members of the public here, um, other than, well, I do want to acknowledge the two uh, uh, council candidates um, that are in the audience. Um, but uh, does any member of the public wish to address the council on this item? Mayor Story? Uh, yes. Oh. It looks like Vice Mayor Kaiser has her hand up for a question. Oh, yeah, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation, Steve and Karen. Um, I was curious, so if we're gonna go forward, are, are we going forward with the rope lights or are we going forward with the LED lights or are we gonna see these before we move forward? Sorry, I'm a little confused. If we're gonna just say, go with what works best and put it up there or are we gonna see anything before we go into contract? I think the proposal the is to system try and move forward with the coaxial LEDs, but we would like to see them first. And if they match what we believe they will look like, give them authority to move forward with that installation. If not, if that, if they put those up and they don't like them, we don't like them, then we go back to the rope light, warm white rope lights. Either In either case, we'd like to, the BIA needs to get it under contract, so they'd like to try and get that approval tonight. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions? Um, seeing none, I'll, I'll ask, um, well, now the recommended action doesn't consider a motion. I don't think you are asking for a motion from council or? Um, I think we are. I apologize if I didn't put a motion in there. Um, Just as to consider a request. I, th I think the uh, I think a motion would be appropriate. I think the motion would be appropriate to authorize the approval uh, of the, the installation of the either alternative, understanding that the intent is to test out the new coaxial LED lights, and if they're satisfactory, go with them. Okay. Uh, is there a council member that would like? Okay, we have a uh, um, that's moved by Council Member Brown. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, and uh, uh, well. Um, seconded by Council Member Brooks. Let's have a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. I approve. 
Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you to the BIA. Thank you, Karin, for moving this item forward after a long delay. And we all look forward to seeing whatever lights work out the best um, for the holidays. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the Park Avenue traffic calming report. Um, this is uh, one, the recommended action is to provide feedback on traffic calming options for Park Avenue um, and to direct public work staff to conduct uh, public outreach on the proposed alternatives. Can we have a staff report? Great. All right. Is, does everything look okay? It does. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, tonight we are here to present to you uh, the results of our Park Avenue traffic calming analysis. So. Well, I'll start by just giving you some background. So uh, the kind of impetus to this was back in about 2020, um, supporting the Capitola Police Department, the uh, Public Works Department completed an engineering and traffic study. Um, the, uh, the way that study worked is there were about 47 city streets within the city of Capitola that were reviewed for their 85th percentile and looking at the uh, the change in, in speeds over time and in, in viewing that there was a few streets that stood out one of them being Park Avenue that had a little bit of a higher speed than uh, would be desired within our, our community and so at the direction of council we were asked to take a look at the uh, options that might be available to reduce uh, speeds along that corridor that travels east and west um, on the on this side of, of town the uh, scope of the project was to look mainly at the seg segments from Monterey Avenue to Coronado, uh, but in addition, we did look at the, comp the segment from Coronado to McGregor Kennedy, and then also at the section of Park Avenue underneath uh, Highway 1. So from our existing conditions, um, the, the, this section of roadway was, was improved in 2017. Uh, what we have, what we have currently, is Class Two bike lanes, which is uh, the difference between the kind of the main three classes of bike lanes. Is Class One would be a, a dedicated road or path for for bicycles. Class Two are the type that we typically see on our roads, where you have a, a bike lane on the side of the roadway with its dedicated bike uh, share, uh, arrows there. And then Class Three are the ones where we have sharrows, where the bicycles are allowed to share the road with the vehicles. And uh, as part of that improvement in 2017, when we put in the sidewalks um, from the section of McGregor to Wesley, uh, we added uh, we added curb gutter and sidewalk on the north side of the of the road. And while we were doing that, we we were taking into consideration speeds along Park Avenue. And what we did then was to reduce the lane, the vehicle lane width to 10 and a half feet. And um, with working with our traffic engineers, that. Uh, approach does tend to reduce uh, average speeds of vehicles by narrowing the width. Uh, if you're on a freeway, I think your, your lane widths are much wider than that. So as you, as you get narrower, it just tends to get drivers to drive a little bit slower. So we did apply uh, what would be called a road diet from the section of uh, Monterey to Wesley when we finished that uh, sidewalk project in, in 2017 or 2019, sorry. Um, so in looking at the full roadway section, it's about one mile in length. We looked at a, a, a handful of different options for what we could do to decrease speeds along this segment of Park Avenue. Um, the list of those is horizontal controls, and I'll go through an example of what these are in the uh, upcoming slides. Vertical controls, uh, lane de delineators, road diets, which we, we just alluded to, uh, buffered bike lanes, uh, speed feedback signs, and green bike lanes. So now we'll take a look at what those all look like. 
So here are an example of the horizontal control options that we took a look at. Um, in order to do this, you need a much wider section of roadway because what we're asking drivers to do is instead of driving in a, in a straight path down the center line, um, we're, having, we're, having them, we're adding kind of a meandering route. Um, you, so you need a little bit more width to accommodate that. And the only section of Park Avenue that does have that right now is from, uh, it's from Wesley to Coronado. Um, the thing about that was that that wasn't the segment of Park Avenue that we were seeing the most increased speeds. Um, and in review, reviewing this at a staff level and with our traffic engineers, we didn't determine that this was something we wanted to recommend for a few reasons. One being that if you can, it may be hard to see in the slide, but the, when you meander your, your roadway, you end up having the, the drivers kind of go closer and further away from the bike lane. And so you actually have decreased separation between cyclists and vehicles in those portions. And then in addition to that, it requires a little bit more attention. And given that this is also the segment of Park Avenue that you have the nice clear views of the ocean, we just felt that this wasn't a good combination of, of uh, factors to give the drivers and, and also understanding that this wasn't the most challenging section is from a speed aspect, we're not recommending this approach to be employed along Park Avenue. Vertical controls um, are, are things that we've seen done in other portions of town. So we went uh, along and did this on Jade Street and 42nd, and this vertical controls are often referenced as speed bumps and humps and tables. Um, the, the, the challenge with those is that those aren't typically something that we want to employ on our arterial streets. So our uh, example, what our, our arterial streets are, our 41st, Capitola Road, Park Avenue, Wharf Road, Bay Avenue, Cliff Drive, and Capitola Ave. So those are our main arterial streets in, in town, and the, adding these types of features in those is just not a recommended approach to do so, given that those are the main roads that we get the most volumes and the, and the highest levels of traffic. It, it just didn't uh, sync up with the recommendations from staff and from our traffic engineers. Uh, the other feature that we have displayed here are road delineators. And this was a good idea. We, we did consider this heavily, but the problem with road delineators, and that's, you can kind of see there, uh, that cyclist on the lower right, those white pylons, they're usually plastic pylons that get added to the, uh, the division between the bike lane and the vehicle lanes. Uh, can serve as a good visual deterrent and separation between those two types of travel. Uh, the challenge that that then poses, and, and we've heard this from multiple jurisdictions as well as just seeing it in, in, you know, in our own backyards, is that it makes it a, a huge challenge to maintain those as a debris-free area for the cyclist. So you can separate the car as well from the cyclist, but then if you can't keep it clean and free of debris, it becomes a more dangerous area for cyclists. Uh, a really good example that maybe many of us have seen is if you go on Wharf Road right underneath the Highway 1 towards the north, right on the right-hand side there's a series of delineators just like this, and they're almost always covered in the eucalyptus leaves. Um, and it just doesn't uh, lend itself well to a safe riding condition for cyclists. And given that Park Avenue has the same issue with lots of overhanging eucalyptus, we didn't want to add this additional challenge of, of having to have, to have a much larger amount of maintenance in order to keep a safe area for cyclists to be traveling. And then, so now we're going to review uh, four additional measures that we took a look at. So a road diet was something that is, is something we talked about before at the beginning where we've employed along the first segment of Park Avenue. It's something that's a little simpler to do because it doesn't require a wider section of roadway. You, you know, you can bring the road down to the minimum uh, of around 11, 10 and a half, 11 feet. And given uh, the existing conditions, Currently, this segment of Park Avenue have uh, about 12 foot wide lane widths. So reducing those by one foot to one and a half feet uh, should have a, a decrease um, in the overall speeds for vehicles uh, in this area. Um, in addition, we have the width to add buffered bike lanes, which would be uh, shown there in the bottom right hand corner. That picture shows how the, the typical bike lane is just one white stripe between that and the vehicle travel lanes. You can add, depending on the uh, width of the road, you can add between a foot or two feet, depending on what we have available to us, um, and add additional separation. And so that gives cyclists a little bit more room to be um, free of, of movements with the car, so you know you don't have any conflict with um, you know, uh, 
you know, wide side view mirrors or handlebars, and so you do have a little bit more separation, provides a little bit more safety, and also then restricts the road width to the vehicles, so that also provides a little bit of a calming effect there. Uh, green bike lanes is something that we've been doing um, with all of our new road projects, it's something that we did do at Highway One, at the Highway One underpass at Park Avenue as well, uh, back in 2017. And what that does is it just it highlights the, those areas at all the intersections where there's going to be um, a bike lane that either starts or passes through that intersection. Um, so the picture on the top right shows what we're planning to do uh, with this project would be at all the intersections. Um, of roadways intersecting Park Avenue, we would add these green bike boxes um, at the initiation of the lane so that when drivers first come onto the roadway, they see it. And then as they're exiting the roadway, they have that dash se dashed section of green lane um, just to make it aware for the drivers that that is also an area that they should be anticipating um, potentially having cyclists in those zones. And then the other, the other tool that we have here on display are speed feedback signs. We do have one of those out there right now um, as you're exiting the, the um, Park Avenue going out of town. And uh, in, a, in reviewing this, we, we spoke with the police department and, and tried to get some feedback from them and as well as the community when we were holding workshops during the, the, uh, the sidewalk project about where we're, they were observing some of the ch uh, most challenges with increased speeds. And I'll have a slide later on showing where we do recommend adding one of those. Um, to look at what we have currently as far as existing safety features along Park Avenue, we did add a, um, a crossing uh, at the intersection of Coronado, or I think this Coronado, I think it's at Coronado and, and Park Avenue, and that does allow uh, pedestrians, it's, a, it's called a mid-block crossing because it's not protected by either a signal or a stop sign, but it does allow for pedestrians to cross there and they can um, they can press the, uh, the button there and then you'll see a series of rapid flashing beacons go off to provide additional um, notification to drivers that there's going to be a pedestrian crossing. Here we can see that these are the yellow high visibility uh, crosswalks that go in, in, in concert with this because we are in a school zone here along Park Avenue. And then I'll show you on our next slide. Um, we wanted to highlight some of the uh, investigation we did at the intersection of the highway and Park Avenue. So I think in 2017 we did go through a full effort of adding a full set of green bike lanes throughout the section of roadway because of the uh, challenge with just the turning movements of people getting onto and off of the freeway and, and then the, the narrow road width that exists along this segment of Park Avenue. Uh, it did get brought to the attention of council at a previous meeting that there was a challenge here at the this corner that's on the left side of the screen here where the, the bike lane is fairly, it seems fairly narrow and it uh, overlaps with an existing storm grate. Um, in order to try to determine what was put possible here, we looked at the overall lane widths and there are prescribed minimum lane widths from Caltrans whenever you're in their corridor. and. Even though we do have a full 50-foot-wide 50 wide, 50 wide section of roadway here, uh, we didn't have any additional space to widen the bike lanes um, because the travel lanes are already, already at their minimum, and so we, there wasn't any opportunity to adjust what we had available. So what we did find um, our ability to do was to take um, that immediate area and just improve the, the riding surface for cyclists. So prior to that, and I think the reason this got brought to our attention was just the the asphalt and concrete had been deteriorating over time. We looked into the opportunity to maybe move this storm drain out of this, this corner and around the corner, but we had a conflict with some of the Caltrans equipment, and so that wasn't a possibility for us. And so what we, we did is we changed out the type of storm grate that's there, so it's a little bit more um, uh, susceptible to narrow tires on cycling that may, some cyclists use so that you don't have the worry that maybe your tire is going to get trapped and then as well our public works team was able to smooth out that section of asphalt and then repair and patch those segments of sidewalk so we were able to bring this up to I think as best as we can get right now um, and so I just wanted to make sure that that was understood that that request came to council a little while back and we were able to achieve a, a good result here. 
So now I just want to go through what our proposed improvements are. If you go through the full report that we had attached to this, there were three main alternatives that were provided. Those kind of broke down those, those seven or eight items that we were considering and then packaged those into a few different alternatives that we thought were plausible to look at. Um, but our recommended alternative is alternative one, which has a combination of these four items with a lane diet throughout the full segment of Park Avenue from Monterey to Coronado. Um, adding a speed feedback sign here at the exit of Washburn, where a lot of students do come out from New Brighton Middle School. And then um, adding the bike buffer in all the areas that we have enough uh, road width in order to accommodate uh, the full bike buffer. And then the green bike striping that we spoke about a, on an, a, an earlier slide. So this is what our, our package of improvements we think we can bring. Um, the Looking at the traffic analysis that de decreases the road uh, speeds or should decrease the road speeds by about two to three miles an hour. And then in the immediate areas of these speed signs, there's, there's there, um, anticipated to be a little bit lower um, speed um, as a result of people seeing those feedbacks and and this particular area was of concern due to the um, challenge that we have when students are coming out of school we it's we definitely want to see uh, drivers you know abiding by the speed limits when they're in these school zones at this point, our next steps are to uh, come to City Council here tonight and get any community input from Council as well as the community tonight and then um, move forward with going into a public outreach effort which we would anticipate being um, some type of uh, Zoom uh, public, public meeting to maximize the amount of input that we can get from the community and then as well doing a survey. We've done that on a couple of previous road projects and felt that we got good feedback from those who were maybe not able to attend the meeting but still had thoughts that they wanted to share with our team. Um, after getting that feedback tonight and in the future outreach efforts, we would then refine what we have as our existing design, complete those plans, and bring them back to council uh, for approval to take it out to bid. So our estimated problem. Hey, Lush, oh. that that last piece. I'm so sorry. I you you spoke a little too quickly on that last piece. Can you tell me again what kind? You did outreach already, or you did not do outreach? No. So this is like the, the tonight would be the first piece of the outreach. So bring bringing this to council for your input tonight. Um, if there is any public input that we do receive tonight, would we would take into consideration and then. We're asking for direction to then pursue a, a more uh, thorough public outreach effort. Well, we would we would do a, a Zoom public outreach meeting and as well as a um, a survey online. And so, what our estimated project schedule would be is we would finish that public outreach component over this fall, um, allowing us to complete design uh, this winter and put the project out to bid for in the winter time with the hope to then have construction of the project completed in the spring of 23. And so here is our recommended um, recommendations to councils to provide feedback on the traffic calming options that we've presented tonight and then direct our staff to conduct the public outreach effort on the proposed alternatives. And now I'm open for any questions from council and mayor or the community. All right. Thank you, Kailash, for that report. Um, I'll go to um, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the staff report and it, it's talking about the planned outreach and the Zoom meeting and the online survey. survey. And um, I'm just wondering, will uh, local residents be receiving kind of those green cards in the mail informing them that there's going to be a Zoom meeting and a survey? Or do they have to come to the city website and find it for themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. I did uh, miss saying that. We would like to do send out our postcards to kind of a buffered area around Park Avenue. We could extend it. I think typically we do our outreach to about a 300-foot buffer from the project area, so we would plan to do it that way. If there's a, a larger zone that we'd like to do or if we could maybe message the um, school district or something like that, we'd be open to any, uh, any suggestions on, on how to make, maximize the outreach that effort that we go through. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just concerned that, you know, if people aren't looking for an opportunity to participate, then they won't know there is an opportunity to participate. So I think that those um, kind of mailers um, are, a great, are a great way to let people know that those opportunities are there. So thank you. And the mayor's story, I don't know if you can see him because his, his video is off, but Jacques, Jacques also has his hands um, raised. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Brown. Yeah. 
Yeah, because yeah, we can't see him here. But um, I'll go to Council Member Bertrand. Can you hear us? I uh, guess I can, and um, I appreciate uh, the all, all the help I can get to be recognized. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so um, I appreciate that uh, you're planning outreach. Uh, I think that's great. Um, are you planning to reach out to the uh, Bicycle Coalition? Um, they come to some meetings I think you participate in. Uh, we haven't, but it, it, that's a good recommendation. We can definitely let them know that we'll be having those those meetings, and, we, and then we can get any input from them at that time. Yeah, I think they'd be, uh, appreciate uh, being reached out uh, out to on this issue, and you know they involve themselves in many things dealing with the RTC uh, and bicycle issues and other plants around the, the county. So yeah, thanks for doing that. And generally, I support this. I'm very happy. Um, well, I was there. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions from council members? Um, seeing none. Um, yeah, Kailash, I had, a, I had a few questions and uh, to start with, I know you mentioned lane diet, um, but I'm not quite sure what exactly that is and what would constitute a diet? Okay. Just making narrow yeah. roads? That, that's correct. So a diet would be, so you take a roadway. So currently the roadway sections along Park Avenue are about 12 feet wide. So we would reduce those lane widths down to about 10 and a half feet or 11 feet. And so that's kind of a diet. Uh, that, uh, it's just the term that gets used to describe that, that right. practice. And so just using striping right. along and to make the road narrower. Um, and that would make the bike lane wider or allow for a buffered bike lane? Both, both. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and you mentioned having the speed feedback sign, um, and having it at Washburn. Um, and, um, I, I was my, and this is my personal observation is that a lot of speeding takes place as people are going down the hill mm -hmm. just past Washburn. Um, so I would just, you know, maybe recommend looking at that. Maybe the speed feedback would be better placed at the bottom of that hill instead of the top. Or if we can put them in both, that's good too. Uh, but um, just one observation about, you know, the uh, road topography there. Um, the, the, and I was wondering, was, is there any consideration or thought about our, the ability to maybe put in a uh, stop sign at either Washburn or, um, I mean, imagine Washburn would be the most suitable place for it, but. So we, we looked at that when the sidewalk project was, was uh, first being built, because um, at the time I think we were anticipating potentially that the rail trail would be sooner and we wanted to have a crossing there. Mm -hmm. um, working with our traffic consultants, that wasn't the recommended approach. I think they, um, we'd have to do a, a, a warrant analysis to do that, but I, I think at the time we had already looked at that pretty heavily and, and it didn't, it didn't play out to be a, an option that they recommended for us to look at. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I anticipate that being something that does get brought up during our public outreach, and so we, we can make sure that we address that when that um, when that comes up. Okay, so that's not necessarily off the table, but not at this point considered the the most ideal. Right. Okay. Um, we do have a new crosswalk um, since the sidewalk has been put in um, near that vicinity. Um, is there a possibility of I mean, in the vein of narrowing the lanes, putting in uh, curb outs um, around where the sidewalk is to... At that particular one or just in, as a general approach? Well, I was, I mean, I was thinking of that one in particular because it is, uh, it's a new crossing there. Um, and it doesn't, I, it doesn't have a flashing signal at, at that location. Uh, the one that crosses park it does it does have a flashing signal oh it does, it does at the activate, upper yeah. the, the new one yeah i know the one down in coronado does but right yeah okay well, i think oh maybe we're talking about the same one or 
Is there a second one that you're referencing? Maybe I'm. I'm well, I well I thought I observed, observed when we put in the sidewalk, we put in a crosswalk either at Washburn or Wesley. Yeah. Am I am I mistaken about that, Steve? Uh, no, you're right. That's 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 the one I I tried to highlight here. Isn't that Cabrillo? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's Cabrillo. You're right. Oh, Cabrillo. Okay. You got it. Cabrillo oh, has a. I'd say. Yeah. And it has a flashing light, rapid flashing beacon with it. Okay. I'll, I'll just answer the real question. The question about putting bulb outs there. Right. It's where the bike lanes are. So then you have to. You run out of room. Right, right lanes have to, to do navigate around it. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, um, and then just um, on um, the um, outreach, yeah, I, I think that if we could have an expanded, um, you know, notice, um, but um, will there still maybe plan on being a location on our website so that somebody, if they wanted to make a recommendation, they could just go on the website um, and even if they didn't get a, a, you know, a notice, but if they're aware of it, they could give input uh, at the website. Yeah, so. that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that's how we tried to do it last time. So we had a, we had it as an event on the on the front page of the mm -hmm. website. I also tried to push it out through social media and then have it as a available link for I think we you know we could do it for a month or so and just have the survey online survey available so that uh, community members and we can keep that active on the website for that duration of time until we've kind of felt like we've consolidated all our feedback and with those you can actually see how how, you know, how your surveys are coming in. So you can see if we've gotten a good peak of surveys and then if it starts mm -hmm. tapering off and you know, make sure that it's still staying front and center. And if we, we you know, cease to have any additional surveys provided, then you kind of know that we've, we've kind of maybe reached the end of the, of the impact okay. that we're gonna get. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I see uh, uh, Council Member Brooks. That's, you still have your hand up? Or? Thank you. Yeah. I, I do, just a quick question. Um, Kayla, she mentioned something about Park and Kennedy and McGregor all the way on the other, all the way on the other end. Um, and I, if I recall, you talked about like making that more safe and to, to cross. And was that part of any of these plans here? Or have you, you know, like it'd be nice to have a crosswalk on one of those corners, but it doesn't connect to some of the city. And I know there was something going on with that, but that, that's. I thought that'd be part of this. Yeah, so th that wasn't part of this uh, review, but we are looking at that for the Kennedy sidewalk project. Well, we would be extending sidewalk. Um, it's a it's a future project that we'll be bringing to council um, that's been funded, and that that'll that does address that intersection there. So that would be um, uh, rolled into that project. At this time, we weren't looking at it for as, as a component of this Park Avenue traffic calming study. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think we funded that sidewalk project on that that side of it so I'm just wondering if there were you know if we're striping or doing anything with this particular project if that could be something we added on so, so we received some RTC grant funding on that um, so that what we, we requested oh. that to the RTC and then we, were, we did uh, receive that grant funding so that would be uh, that projects funded through that grant excellent that's all good news thank you Okay, um, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kailash. I, um, I saw the green um, striping for sort of just at the intersections of the bike lane on park. And so I don't know if this is even anything that is done, but would, the, would it be possible to do the entire bike lane green? Since we do get a lot of debris, and I feel like that would make it more visible when it is covered by the eucalyptus and stuff, or is that just, I don't know, it may not be like an aesthetically pleasing thing either. So just wondering just to make it like as obvious as possible. Yes, um, so I think with that, the kind of industry kind of the approach that everyone's doing is to do it the way we're promoting it. Um, Surprisingly, that green paint is is very very expensive. So if we were to if we were to stripe the entire one of those lanes entirely green, I think that would be the same as the cost for the full roadway to be restriped. And so, you know, okay. I think it does come into more of like a funding limitation. Um, it's not that you can't do that, but 
Um, it would, you know, it's something we could evaluate as far as a cost approach, but I, I think it would probably push, put us beyond the allocation that we were given by council to complete this project. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more questions from council members, I'll just ask if there's any members of the public that would like to address the council on this item. Uh, yes, please come up. Thank you. Um, I was curious, um, you said that the road delineators would trap debris and leaves in the bike lane potentially um, if there might be some kind of um, alternative to the post that would create that kind of um, debris like um, something that could provide physical feedback to drivers to have a more protected bike lane I'm thinking something similar to those little bright yellow bumps or other larger bumps I just know me personally I would feel a lot more comfortable riding a bike if there was, um, in addition to a uh, buffered bike lane, some sort of physical feedback to uh, make sure drivers don't swerve into the bike lane. I think that's something that we could take into consideration. I think our limitation is just something that would still allow our sweeper to, to clear those areas. So that's something we can look at as far as maybe small, like you're kind of alluding to something small that would be, you know, more along the, the height of a, of a, like a, the, the lights and the bumps that are oftentimes you'll see on other roadways. So yeah. um, I think we can we can include that as part of our um, review when we, we do our, our outreach component. Great. Thank you. Thank Would you. you like to mention your name for the record? Uh, my name is Alexander Peterson. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Um, Jamosh, can you, Mayor Story, I'm so sorry. It was going in and out. I don't know if that was just me. Oh, okay, I see nods of heads from the other council members. Can we, um, repeat the, the comment or maybe if Kayla she want to just tell us what the speaker said yeah uh, he was just asking if there were any other types of physical um, just I guess notifications or separators for vehicles to be added to the bike lane um, maybe that's not quite as large as the the larger uh, um, delineators but small enough that would still um, notify vehicles that they're straying outside of the bike lane or outside of the vehicle lane, but would still accommodate the ability for us to maintain a clear um, path of travel for the cyclists. And I, I think that's something we could um, have as part of our review during the public outreach. Could bots dots serve that purpose? I, I mean, I, I'm not sure. We'll have to. I think we'll have to look at what's what's allowed and what's recommended, and, and I think it's, it's worth investigating in that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I think in general, bot dots are a recommended treatment between a bike lane and a car lane because if you're a bike, going over them can be a little bit dicey. But I know on Highway One, they have some haptic feedback strips that are used between bike lanes and traffic. Yes. Traffic, and so that's right, right. the same kind of idea, but also not necessarily going to take out a bike if right. it's a little bit wet or Got something. It. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, so, no other members of the public in the audience are. Is there anyone on Zoom that would like to speak on this item? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Janet, if you can unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. Great. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is my name is Janet Edwards, and um, both of my sons attended New Brighton School, and the traffic in that area is very heavy at, at the end of school. And if you're doing a public outreach, I would suggest that you get something in the school's newsletter so that the parents of all those students can have some input as to what they see um, happening when the kids get out of school. Great, great, thank you, we will do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Edwards. Um, which I also, I mean, I think it would be nice to ask the students. Um, many of them are riding their bikes using Park Avenue, and so if we could get their participation, uh, I think that that could be very helpful. Um, any other um, Zoom attendees? No, thank you. Um, 
Well, seeing none, I'm going to bring it back uh, to council for further deliberation. Um, and I think that um, this is just a matter of providing more feedback. Um, uh, I have a feeling maybe that we did that already. I'll just ask if council members have anything further they would like to um, uh, present on this. I believe council I member Bertrand has his hand raised. Yeah, uh, okay, council member Bertrand, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was waiting for Kristen to point it out, but okay, not this time. Anyway, just got to have some fun here. Um, you know, this has been a long-standing issue. Um, I think when I first came to Capitola, there was actually um, a little committees around Capitola, and there was one in this area that pointed out that uh, Park Avenue is quite dangerous. Uh, people would be looking at their uh, views and wandering around and um, hitting people and having accidents. So, you know, it's gotten better over the years because we've done things. So I'm very happy that um, Public Works and staff, uh, Kalos, thanks for the presentation, have put so much effort into this. Um, I appreciate the options. Um, I, I think you did some detailed engineering to try to figure out which was something that would work best within the confines of Park Avenue and the conditions presented by this, I mean, the uh, data presented by this, the speed study, which I looked at. Um, you know, I, I just am very happy you did this, and I definitely like option one. I'm particularly happy with the protective planes. I think that will provide a lot of comfort for this uh, particular corridor. Um, so thank you very much for the effort. All right. Count, thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Any other council members have comments? Um, well, let me just say uh, thank you uh, for that presentation, for your recommendations. Uh, I know this is an important, significant uh, project for the city. Uh, I think we all look forward to the public outreach and being able to um, participate. Um, and I would certainly encourage all the residents of Capitola uh, to participate and um, help us. Uh, make this a safer community. All right. Thank you, Kailash. The next item is item 8D, which is consider an amendment, or strike that, consider an ordinance amending Capitola Municipal Code Section 2.04.275 as recommended by the Finance Advisory Committee. Right, uh, the go. recommended action is to consider the uh, Finance Advisory Committee's recommendation to adjust council member compensation and approve the first reading of an ordinance amending Capital Municipal Code Section 2.04.275 pertaining to city council member salary to provide an adjusted salary of $660 per month for the members of the city council to be effective upon the start of the new terms of office following the November 2022 general municipal election. And um, Jim, do you want to lead us in this presentation? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Story. Good evening, Council. And I'm going to agree with Karin. It's good to be back, but this does feel a little weird. <laughs> um, so as you just I hope it's not me. No. no. <laughs> How is this advancing? You're, oh, you just, just click. One more click. There you go. Okay, just to provide a little bit of background, in uh, September of 2019, City Council adopted Ordinance 1032, which amended the code section the mayor just referred to, 2.04.275, um, adjusting council member salaries to 600 per month. Adjusted salaries became effective following the November 2020 election. Um, this past year, uh, past spring when we were going through our 2022-23 budget hearings, City Council requested that the Finance Advisory Committee do a, a follow-up review to council member compensation. And that review was done by the FAC Finance Advisory Committee on Jul at their July 19th meeting. Um, I just want to point out that um, the only other commissioners or elected officials that we have at the city that get um, compensated are planning commissioners and um, their last adjustment to compensation really was in 2009 was kind of a reduction because they went from 250 a month to 125 a meeting and they generally only do one meeting a month now 
and prior to that it had um, I believe it, it was 1750 a meeting seventeen dollars and fifty cents a meeting from 1967 until November of 2000 so they've only had a couple of adjustments I just want to point that out as I go to this next slide to kind of give a history of the city councils so um, this next slide just kind of shows the increases when it was first uh, when council first received compensation for being on the council was in February of 66 and since then we've only done a handful of um, adjustments to that compensation generally about anywhere from 11 to 14 years apart um, so that was what, something that we were kind of looking at in 2020 is how do we get this on a more regular schedule um, the California government code section does allow for um, code section 36516 allows for increases of up to 5% a year for every year since the last adjustment however any increase again doesn't go into effect until after the next election so we could look at it um, on an annual basis but it would actually only change every other year um, again the last increase was in December of 2020 and that was an increase from 500 to 600 per month and at that point the the maximum was 990 that we could have gone to now um, 600 becomes our base so 5% a year for the last two years our maximum is um, 660 for Dece and it could go into effect December of this year is anyone else still losing sound from within chambers yeah it's cutting out quite a quite a bit Okay, it's the echo. Sorry, I was trying to balance between the echo and have, have you actually hear me. I turn it down. Um, we did uh, look at mayor and city council member salaries um, in, and compared them to uh, cities, the same cities, that 11 cities that we used for our last employee compensation study. Um, you can see we looked at what our rates are in that first column and then the average and the median. We're somewhat in the ballpark. Um, on council and, um, and we have the same salary for the mayor I'm not sure if as a general law city we can do anything different than that I'd have to look into that um, and then population overall revenues and then per capita so so again that was the 11 kind of central coast cities that we generally look at for employee compensation studies so this um, was presented to the finance and uh, advisory committee and that slide should header should say fact recommendation um, and the fact has recommended an increase to council member salaries of 5% per year so it'd be an increase to 660 per month and then we're asking to approve the first reading of an ordinance amending Cal uh, Capitola Municipal Code section 2.04275 we did have a um, brief discussion regarding including benefits and um, at this time the recommendation did not include additional benefits but um, that's something we could do each time we review it is, is review that as well and um, the FAC also recommends doing a review as we go through our budget process with the potential to do adjustments every two years um, and I think the thought process there was to kind of just stay a little bit more up with cost of living adjustments and inflation rather than wait until once every decade or decade and a half or so um, fiscal impact going to 660 per month is about 3,800 a year. It would start this year. It'd be about half that for this fiscal year and then become 3,800 a year. Um, and I will also add that um, Mayor Story and Vice Mayor Kaiser serve on the Finance Advisory Committee and they abstain from voting on the recommendation um, and can take part in this discussion. That concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Bertrand, did you have any questions? And I don't see any hands up from the council members, other council members on Zoom. Um, so at this time, I will ask if any members of the public wish to address the council um, on this item. Uh, good evening again, Karen Hanna. Um, I was on the council when it was $150 a month, so go council. Um, I just feel like I have to say that 
kind of almost making this an automatic conversation every two years and then almost being kind of an automatic increase every two years, pretty soon you're going to talk about some serious money. Um, so I just, you know, I, I'm not sure the workload is really increasing all that rapidly and that maybe not making it feel like it's going to be an automatic thing would be more uh, appropriate. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's not a lot of money in the budget, but um, maybe every two years is a little much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other um, members of the public in the audience uh, saying none? Are they, do we have any Zoom participants? That would With that, I'll bring it back uh, for further council deliberation, and uh, we do need a motion on this item since it's an amendment to an ordinance. Um, and also, just to clarify, the this particular motion and or the ordinance amendment only pertains to the one-time adjustment to six hundred and sixty dollars a month. There's, yeah, the, there's no um, automatic, you know. Uh, to your reviews or anything else built into these actions tonight. Um, so with that, um, is, I'll see Councilmember Brooks with her hands up. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I have a question about that adjustment um, and annual review. I, I don't know, and I, maybe this is a question for our city attorney about whether there's any pro anything that prohibits us from actually doing that. Um, sure, I can answer that. Thank you, Councilman Brooks. And the answer is yes. The statute actually does not allow the council to enact an automatic increase for future years. Unlike, for instance, an MOU that governs employees, you can have like a four-year MOU that promises increases over four years. Council members cannot do that. The only way that council members can enact increases is the way that you're doing right now. You have to do it by ordinance, which actually requires two readings. And so it's actually a pretty involved process. And also the amount by which you can increase is governed by statute. It, it depends on the size of your community, of your city. And so, um, the procedure is governed and the amount. So it actually, it, it cannot be automatic. Okay. My, my understanding of the staff recommendation is actually that you consider it each year or each two years. And the reason I think, and I'm happy to be correcting if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is the reason for that recommendation is um, in, in part big governance, I see other cities have their councils consider or the councils decide to consider this every year so you can decide whether or not to take the increase and it is because the increase is so minor um it's a way to just make sure it's on council's radar each year okay great thank you um I'd, I'd be interested in getting just a little bit more feedback maybe from staff on the annual so you're saying annual is common versus the every two years to stay in, in step in alignment with the election cycle. Um, and maybe this is some research that was done by staff and, and Samantha, that's what I'm hearing you say as well. It's it, not necessarily annually, just periodically. So it could be okay. annually, it could be two years, three years, whatever the council decides, but periodically it is good because otherwise you could go 10, 15 years without considering it. And then it just becomes more difficult. Okay, um, thank you. Mayor Story, I'm prepared to make a, a motion um, to, to move forward with the Finance Advisory Committee um, to increase council member salaries of 5% per year to 660 per month and approve the first reading of ordinance amending capital and municipal code section 2.04.275 um, and to review the council members um, salary um, every two years. Well, I'll second that, and I have a comment. 
Okay, I just wanted to clarify the motion that goes beyond what the staff recommended action is. Is that? So did she want to go that far? Just wanted to make sure that yeah. Council, Council Member Brooks. Let's bring the recommendation up again. Oh, there it is. No. So I'm just reading the first paragraph, Mayor's story. I don't think I need to include the benefits in my motion because I'm. Um, that I don't think it's necessary, and we didn't have it before. Um, and I don't need to read the impact financially. I was just reading that we would move forward with the finance subcommittee's recommendation and to review salaries every two years. Do I have that? I think that was the additional part. Yeah. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. So was that okay? One, yeah. Can I do something? Am I missing something? Yeah, the um, the part about potential adjustments every two years is, is not within the recommended um, staff action. Um, it's, it's only the first paragraph. It, right, and so I just added that because it right. says as an option, annual review during budget hearings, potential adjustments every two years. So my motion is that council would review Council's salary, it would come back every two years. Okay. Can I make a, a friendly amendment? Sure. Well, let, well, Can we amend that to say that the Finance Committee would, would review council salary every two years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever our process is, I, I suppose I could be better. Yeah. Okay, the secondary agrees with that. Okay. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Um, I have just had a comment. Yes, go ahead, Council Here. Member Bertrand. Um, I just uh, thank the uh, caller who uh, uh, got on the line, and I agree with the caller's sentiment. Uh, it seems like we're constrained, as Sam, our city attorney, uh, dictated to us, but I agree with the general consent that, I mean, the general um, idea that um, we should shouldn't be just increasing it every two years. Uh, certainly our history has indicated otherwise. So, um, but I do support this. So I agree to this, the amendment. Oh, you accidentally muted yourself, Council Member Bertrand. Oh, no, um, I finished talking. Oh, <laughs> um, Council Member Brown, just a quick follow up. And with the Finance Advisory Committee, they just do a recommendation, they don't really deliberate but to say to follow the same process right is that what you were in okay great yes yeah, so same as, as what we're saying right now so it goes to the finance committee they consider uh potential adjustments to our to our salary every two or our, what do they you they make the recommendation yeah they, 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 don't. they would review it and recommend if they think that it should be adjusted or not yes yeah. okay any further comments on the motion Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously, which will bring us to item nine, which is adjournment. Uh, I will adjourn this meeting of the Capitola City Council until the next regularly scheduled meeting on September 22nd at 7 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff. Um, and thank you, everybody out there in the Zoom world uh, for participating in this uh, council yeah, meeting. Okay. Good night, everyone. Goodbye. I don't know how to make it not do that. <laughs>